At least in our country, we don't see rheumatic heart disease and mitral stenosis very frequently. Why? Because the antibiotics and penicillin have kind of eradicated rheumatic fever. Still, it's a problem in third world countries and many other countries. And it is also interesting from a historical point of view, because mitral stenosis was probably one of the first diagnoses which we were able to make with echocardiography. In this chapter, we'll talk about the background of rheumatic heart disease and mitral stenosis and also on how to diagnose it. You'll see, it's very simple. The diagnosis of mitral valve stenosis is actually pretty easy in the most cases. One look and you can see the hallmark of this pathology, doming of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. But there's much more to mitral stenosis. First, let's take a look at some facts. Mitral stenosis almost always is caused by rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic fever involves the heart valves in two-thirds of cases. And since rheumatic fever varies very much from country to country and from continent to continent, we have a large variation in the incidence of mitral stenosis. Since rheumatic fever is less and less common in the Western world due to the antibiotics, we don't see it very frequently in countries like the US or Western Europe but it is still fairly prevalent in countries like, for example, Mozambique or India. Which valves are usually involved? Well, actually, it's almost always the mitral valve which is involved, followed by the aortic valve, the tricuspid valve, and very rarely do we see pulmonic valve involvement. What other forms of mitral stenosis do we see, aside from rheumatic heart disease? Well, stenotic annular calcification, especially in the older population, with approximately 12.5%. However, very rarely does stenotic annular calcification lead to severe mitral stenosis. And then there are also rare forms, congenital forms, such as, for example, the parachute mitral valve or the double orifice mitral valve. Let's briefly review what rheumatic fever actually is. Rheumatic fever is caused by group A streptococcal bacteria, and it usually causes tonsillopharyngitis. Rheumatic fever not only involves the heart, but also the joints, where it causes arthritis, the brain, where it leads to a chorea minor, it forms subcutaneous nodules, and finally, it can involve all different layers or all three layers of the heart, the endocardium, the pericardium, and the myocardium. Rheumatic fever is an antigenic reaction to group A streptococcal pyogens, where it leads to a cascade of inflammatory processes which eventually lead to the formation of so-called Ashoff bodies. Finally, we have tissue destruction and tissue necrosis which lead to the changes that we see in mitral stenosis. As already mentioned, the second most frequent cause of mitral stenosis is stenotic calcification. You see, it's significantly less common than rheumatic heart disease. And here's such an example where you have calcification which spreads from the annulus to the mitral valve leaflet, the posterior leaflet, causing a reduction in mitral valve ophelin and thereby mitral stenosis. Very rarely, however, will we see significant mitral stenosis in the setting of stenotic calcification. However, you have to be aware that even patients who have rheumatically affected valves can have secondary degenerative changes and in the end stage it is often very difficult to say if the primary cause of stenosis was stenotic calcification or rheumatic heart disease. And finally, let's talk about the third cause of mitral stenosis, congenital malformations of the mitral valve. Basically, they're very rare and usually they're combined with other defects. Three typical forms are the so-called annulus hypoplasia form, the parachute mitral valve, and the double orifice mitral valve. Here's an example of a parachute mitral valve, which is characterized by a unifocal insertion of the mitral valve leaflets. If you take a look at the mitral valve, you see that there's a funnel-like stenosis, which is only mild in this case, Patients do not have to have mitral stenosis in parachute mitral valve. We also see that there's a 
strange motion of the valve and that it resembles that of a parachute. So what is the consequence of mitral stenosis, in particular that of rheumatic mitral stenosis? Well, it's a chronic process, or at least it can become a chronic process, and thereby we often see an increase in the severity of mitral stenosis. So it's a progressive disease, however, we often only see symptoms fairly late. The mean duration has been described as being 16 to 3 point years for the occurrence of symptoms. However, after 25 years, only 8% are still asymptomatic. So even if the progression is not as quick as that for aortic stenosis, it eventually leads to problems. The survival of the patient greatly depends on the degree of symptoms. If patients are mildly or almost asymptomatic, they have a very good prognosis. However, if patients are in New York Heart Association class 3 or 4, they definitely need some form of treatment. What are the hemodynamics behind mitral stenosis? Well, the problem is that we have obstruction to inflow to the left ventricle, and thereby we have a gradient between the left atrium and the left ventricle. This means that we have an elevated pressure in the left atrium, which translates to the pulmonary circulation, to the pulmonary capillaries, which leads to pulmonary congestion, and in worst case, even to pulmonary edema. And finally, we also have the development of pulmonary hypertension. What we also see is a reactive pulmonary component to pulmonary hypertension. For example, if you operate these patients for mitral stenosis, you will not infrequently still have residual pulmonary hypertension. The problems of the right heart that we see include tricuspid regurgitation and eventually even right heart failure. Because patients with mitral stenosis, as you will see, often have large atria and because the pressure in the left atrium is usually increased, we not infrequently also see atrial fibrillation. So patients with mitral stenosis can develop a number of different problems which range from dyspnea all the way to pulmonary congestion and pulmonary edema to arrhythmias in particular as already mentioned atrial fibrillation and thromboembolism because we often see slow flow phenomena in the left atrium. So, this was some background information on mitral stenosis, in particular the hemodynamics, which will be very important when we look at the severity of mitral stenosis. But we haven't seen many image clips yet. It's time that we look at the echocardiogram and see how we can make the diagnosis and what we find in patients with mitral stenosis.